good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another one of our Pathway webinars. It's really good to have your company. I'm Andrew Hammond, Education Advisor and uh, to Discover Education and Pathway Lead Editor, and also a head teacher in my in my in my day job, <laughs> which is everybody on the call will know. Uh, if you're in this business of school leadership, your days are long, but uh, uh, a very rewarding job though it may be. But I think part of the job, I think, and that's what we're talking about today is helping to establish that culture of professional learning. I was chatting with our brilliant speaker who I'm going to introduce you to in a moment, just before we went live. And uh, we both agreed that it would be terrific in a school, wouldn't it, if it was cool to be keen. Cool to be keen, whether you're five, 15 or 50. Uh, and uh, we'll get into that a little bit, I think, actually today. How do we create and embed a professional learning culture where, uh, where it is cool to be keen and where we're having as many conversations as we can about pedagogy and practice? and supporting each other and so forth and growing and developing. So that's what today's about. And we've got the perfect speaker to do that. Uh, your camera and microphone will remain off if that's OK for the webinar. And do feel free to, to join in. You know we like this to be a two-way two -way street. We really do. Uh, so I'll keep an eye on the chat stream. Once I've stopped sharing, of course, I'll keep an eye on the chat stream and the Q&A. And I'll post your questions and your comments to, to our guest speaker throughout the conversation rather than waiting until the very end. But then we will allow, allow a little bit of time at the end for questions as well, if there are any more. And then I'm actually going to walk you through the Pathway programme, which many people on the call will have heard about, I'm sure. If you haven't had the chance to actually see it, I'm going to show you today. I'm not going to show you PowerPoint slides. I'm going to show you the actual programme itself, because as you probably know, Pathway is made up of many, many, many different courses, one of which offered by our guest speaker today. Uh, a brilliant, brilliant speaker called Chris Dale, highly experienced, very, very experienced, long, long career as a teacher, as a senior leader in school, senior leadership, and also as director of teaching and learning in a research school. And so uh, perfectly uh, experienced and perfect person to be talking to us about creating and embedding a professional learning culture. Chris is also now senior manager, a regional manager at the uh, NCETM, National, so um, National Centre for Excellence in Teaching and Mathematics. Bit of a mouthful, but it's a brilliant, brilliant organisation. And those people who work closely with the NCTM will know just how brilliant I have. Chris has been into my school several times and worked with my staff uh, on professional development in the subject of maths, actually. And it was brilliant. So, um, Chris, it just remains for me to say welcome. I hope you're there to join us. I'm really pleased that you're able to join us this afternoon. And uh, hopefully Chris is there. I'm going to keep an eye on the chat stream as well. There you go. Brilliant. Thank you for giving up your time today. And you are giving up your time for free and we really appreciate it. We really do, because I know you're a busy man, much in demand. Um, but uh, how are you today, Chris? All right? Yes, I'm very well, Andrew. Delighted to be here. Great. Right. Thank you for joining us. And um, so just to remind everybody, um, if you want to post your comments, post your chats, uh, your questions, I'm going to keep an eye on that right the way through. It will be chatting for about half an hour or so, uh, although both Chris and I, uh, we like to chat. So, uh, and this is uh, this is your expert subject. This is a home game for you, Chris, isn't it? When we're talking about professional development. Um, so perhaps just for those on the call that may not have encountered your work yet, but there may be some, I'm sure most have. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your professional journey to date, if that's okay? Be very interested in your career. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I suppose it would be best done um, through almost through the lens of what we're talking about today. Yeah. So, and 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 sort of try and um, reference at which part of my career I became um, particularly interested in some of the things I'm going to mention later. So, um, as you said, I, I'm a maths teacher by trade. I studied engineering at, at Leeds University, did my PGC um, at Leeds University, but a school, a secondary school in Bradford, um, and then took up my first role um, as a secondary maths teacher um, in Suffolk. Um, stayed there um, for a few years and then moved back um, close to where I live now in Cambridgeshire. Um, fairly traditionally, then as a sort of second second in in department, um, got got involved in um, some of the emerging stuff around the uh, national strategies. Um, and I suppose that's probably when I first, you know, this sort of light bulb came on in terms of professional learning and CPD because that was really my you know, certainly in terms of, of of leading that or designing that or facilitating that, that was the first um, awakening moment for me then. I then moved on to be um, a head of faculty, again, in a, in a Cambridgeshire um, secondary school. 
Um, and then after a few years of doing that, um, again, driven by my interest really in, in, in CPD and professional learning and, and school improvement, I moved to be a, a mathematics consultant, or was a key stage three mathematics consultant um, into the national strategies. Um, again, for Suffolk and worked my way up then to be county maths advisor for a number of years. And at that point, it just became so for me that the, one of the key parts of that role were, was this community of um, secondary heads of department in that yeah. case, sort of across the 40 odd Suffolk, Suffolk secondary schools. So that then um, some of the things that we will mention again today is about these communities of practice and professional learning communities. That yeah. was, again, an awakening moment for me of how do we actually design this community to sustain and grow and challenge itself. Um, did a few more advisory roles, including the senior uh, senior secondary advisor and then made the decision to go back into schools. So went in um, back into secondary secondary academy um, as vice principal, senior vice principal, um, primarily focused on um, teaching and learning and, and staff development. As you know, lots of other responsibilities, but those were certainly the two that I was most interested in. And then I, I suppose I became far more heavily interested in some of the, the research behind CPD and um, the academic research. And then that led to more of an interest in, in how do we evaluate the eff efficacy of, of a professional learning, which is a challenge, which I know we'll touch on later. Um, and then really off the back of that uh, became, uh, as you said, a director of a research school working um, directly with the EEF. Um, and also a director of, a, of teaching and learning across multi academy trust um, and that then led me to this this notion of scale really how do we actually scale up effective CPD um, across big schools and actually ultimately across uh, a number of schools and that kind of then leads me to, to my role with the NCTM which is working through maths hub so we're now at a at a kind of regional and national scale of how do we how do we scale up really effective professional learning, evaluate that and use that to, to refine our programs and to, and to push them out at scale. So Perfect. I think that's uh, yes. Teed us up beautifully actually for what we're talking about today and, and the reasons why it had to be you. <laughs> um, so your pathway course, we were very lucky. I really enjoyed that day that we had filming together. And of course you wrote thousands of words to accompany the, the filming that we did. Every pathway course has a, a academic text to go with it, as you would expect. And in the case of Chris, proper academic text. I mean, they all are, but you know, this particularly um, is film uh, quotes and recommendations for further reading, so forth, as you'd expect. And those are accompanied by films. And your, your course in total was called Creating and Embedding a Professional Learning Culture. And I just thought, I think there's a good tradition on these webinars of just beginning by defining terms, really. What do you mean by that before we get into it? So um, I, I suppose you, you could start, I, I, I can't remember who who um, who first used the quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Oh, so so they, I, I can't yeah. remember, I think it's, oh, been, it's been used by lots, but there's uh, something about getting the culture right is yeah. the most important thing. Yeah. And then really my interest in this, I mean, I've had the privilege, obviously, to, to work inside lots of schools, but also to work across schools. And, and really why I'm particularly interested in this is really the different experiences that teachers have working in different schools. Um, and the very best professional um, learning cultures, you know, there's, there's that culture of professional inquiry, both personally as teachers, but also uh, uh, working with other, working collaboratively with other teachers. There's the concept of asking really sharp, better questions about your practice, yeah. um, being open, open to challenge, open doors, even things like that would we'll go back to that, um, really wanting to, to work collaboratively. And then when, and you can, I think you can feel it in a school because I think it permeates the fabric of a school and you can also not feel it in a school, but you know, where that culture of, of constant improve, improvement, wanting to work together to do your best by, by, by the pupils that you serve. So I, I think, and, and just to, I will say this over and over again, that the absolute vital role that leaders have in this, because as leaders, we need to be modeling those behaviors, the, the, those approaches, the, the, being a lifelong learner that we expect from, 
from all of our staff and all of our pupils fundamentally. And, and I think two reasons why it's, it's, it's so important to me. I think there's something around um, teaching as a profession. And I think that, that actually, if, we, if we've really got these cultures right in our schools, it enhances the professionality, the professionalism of, of our profession, which is really important. And also, I just think that kind of culture is an entitlement for every teacher. And I, and I think it's a real shame how teachers can, and I've, I've had this, how teachers can move from one school to another and get a vast, of course, they're going to have different experiences, but a vastly different experience in terms of professional learning. And I, I think, you know, we need to sort of even the playing field a little bit and make sure every teacher is getting um, a really rich, um, a really rich professional learning culture in the establishment they work in. Thank you. Um, brilliant. Spot on. I mean, that's that's exactly what I think we, we all need to be talking about at the moment. And, it, and we know, don't we, that let's be honest, let's address address the elephant in the room and ride it, really, which is that, you know, during lockdown, during the pandemic, and I know as a school leader myself now, again, uh, the, the, the number of different priorities, everything's important, everything's urgent, it, always in this job, but especially at that time when there really were competing priorities, very, very difficult to, frankly, to find the budget even for... Yeah. Uh, for CPD, when you, you you basically spent your supply budget by Christmas on uh, on cover teachers, because obviously many are absent. So there's all those different things. Now I hope um, there is maybe maybe a little bit more time now, and maybe even money. Um, so as we're talking about this, I know because I know you, I know you're going to do this. You're going to offer us advice which is practicable, it's realistic, it's achievable. You know, this isn't Narnia. We know we're going to root this in in the reality of what leaders are going through at the moment, because you talk to leaders every day, don't you? Do you know what I mean? We're going to keep it real and um, and, and sustainable, I suppose, which is a keep it for you, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, recognising that on the receiving end, and this is what Pathway is all about, recognising that on the receiving end is not just a, a knowledge delivery system, but a real human, a person, fleshy person, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and that's very much what we're keen on. So what makes, I mean, in a nutshell, I mean, how do you, how do you catch the ocean in a bucket here? You, you could talk for hours on this, but what makes good CPD for you? What, what does it look like? And what does bad CPD look like in summary? So I suppose I'd, yeah, I always start with these types of questions of going back to, I mean, there's an awful lot around um, evidence-based practice in education nowadays. Um, yeah, the phrase so, you hear a lot. Yes, you do. You do indeed. What does it so, mean? Well, I, I think I would define it as um, really a synthesis between three things. Firstly, we need to look at what external research says, absolutely, because I think that can challenge some of the orthodoxies that we, that we hold. But then ba balance, and then there's an equal balance between that, between our, our professional experience, which is absolutely a, a body of evidence. I and mean, we ignore that at our peril, frankly. Um, and then thirdly, really the context and the vision and values that we work in. And I think if we can kind of synthesize those three evidence bases, that will allow us to make better decisions about everything to do with school leadership, including professional learning and CPD. Um, and I think that also allows us as leaders to articulate the decisions that we've taken in a really clear, measured way. Um, and, and actually ultimately helps us make better decisions, I guess. Um, so, so I, I always, I do always go back to, and, and I'm sure you'll be aware, and I reference this in in the pathway um, course, the going back to the DfE standards for for professional development, and they're still, or I think they're about six years old, um, but very much the, the 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 key themes and the key um, recommendations, almost for CPD, that it needs to be pupil focused, that it does need to be evidence based. Um, that there needs to be collaboration, but but with that com concept of expert challenge as well, there is a danger that collaboration becomes about recycling mediocrity. So there does need to be expert challenge for that, that it needs to be sustained. And again, uh, there's, a, there's a piece of evidence, I think that teachers need to be working on one particular focus thing to do with their classroom practice uh, uh, for two terms minimum to make a difference in the classroom. Um, a, min well, we a minimum of two terms. Oh, sorry. Where, where did you where did you hear me? Well, too? I lost you. I don't know whether the others did. They may not have done. In which case, don't worry. Carry on. <laughs> okay. No, I was just I was just saying that teachers need to be engaged for a minimum of two terms to, on average, to change their practice. So it definitely needs to be sustained. 
And then going back to that thing about an absolute commitment from leadership um, for professional learning. And, and we're, yeah, we're kind of, um, I'm not always sure. So we're, we're grappling with this at the moment that there's a clarity from leaders, whether their teachers are engaged in CPD, that's about personal development, they're developing their own practice, yeah. or is there an element of, of school development within that CPD as well? Because if leaders don't necessarily understand that, we can see where that leads leads to. I also think there's there's something really critical that does the CPD, the professional learning that teachers engage with, is it answering the real questions that they have? And sometimes the answer to that, and I think about you know some of the things that I've I've led, the answer is no. Um, it's not answering the questions. They can't. You're kind of bundling them all together in in the in the same boat. Um, so I I think yeah those kind of things around really high quality CPD and then and then in a sense poor CPD is 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 the opposite of that you know where where it isn't focused on real need um, I think there's also something around where there's where there's not a, a common or sustained focus and it kind of jumps from one thing to another um, that there needs to be that that commitment um, to a longevity and to really working at something because we know actually changing our classroom practice is pretty tough it takes time it does it takes time and how do we get i mean on that subject of sustainability and so forth or you know something that's a sustained effort how do we you know going back to the well each time how do we get professional learning to to stick for want of a better phrase how do we make cpd sustainable then so i think there's there's um Again, I'll start, and I, and I think the fact I'm I'm repeating some things here actually is, is really important. So the way in which um, we make CPD stick, a key thing is to have that commitment from leaders, from leadership. Um, that's absolutely vital. And I think where you you get that, um, and we talked about this before, Andrew, didn't we? Where where, where the culture shifts from this idea of accountability accountability for the pupils you teach, which sounds to me like a almost an external or a hierarchical thing, that shifts then to a, a real responsibility for the pupils um, that you teach. And that then becomes a shared responsibility. And I think if you have a shared responsibility for the pupils you teach, you, you inherently then become interested in how to make their learning mm. better. And of course, what does that lead to? That leads to a commitment to, to, to CPD. So I think that's, you might say it's a bit semantic-y, no, it, but I think it is really important. And I do think in the best schools, teachers have that shared responsibility um, that, that's really, really important. And then just some of the things that you know about having a really sharp focus that it's not generic that there is a subject specificity to it it's sustained it's relevant i think there's also something around um the concept of feedback loops so that actually teachers are getting a sense of how effective what they are doing is and then getting a chance to refine that and then also i, I think there's something there around i think too often we look for the wrong impact or we look for too much impact too early from CPD. Quickly, yeah. And and again, a reference in the pathways of going back. I mean, it's a, it's a seminal piece of work, but going back to those Gusky's five levels of evaluation, being realistic about what the impact might be, um, because we know, you know, and, and it's again, it's about the, the distinction between long term impact and what you might um, find fairly immediately after engaging in a piece of professional learning. Absolutely, absolutely. And could you give maybe some examples of PLC, of pro, uh, professional learning communities that have worked? I mean, you've probably been involved in those, but where, where, where have you seen that work and why did it work so well? I mean, maybe around some of the maths hubs, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, really worked? We're, that's kind of one of the projects I've, I've been um, involved in is, is to try and support the maths. Each maths hub has a you know, professional learning community of, of, of leaders of CPD that work with right. them. Right. And, you know, we've, we've done a lot of work around this and, and delved again a lot into to that, that, that model of evidence-based practice that we've already talked about and sort of looking at um, all of that evidence, it, it became clear really that we needed, often these professional learning communities are almost left to be a bit organic 
you know, that they're actually, they're left to evolve. And, and sometimes that can work, but actually what we needed to do was, was to come up with a design framework really for, for pre professional learning communities, not, not to leave it to chance. And we, we identified five um, principles really um, that underpin that de de design framework. Firstly, that it's really important for these, whatever they look like, and these professional learning communities can be varying size. It could be a, a subject department, it could be a school, but they're there. firstly, there needs to be a common meaning and purpose. Then secondly, absolute need to explicitly plan for professional growth. So there needs to be a sort of long-term plan for the community. Um, thirdly, absolute high levels of professionalism within that community. In essence, this is kind of, um, you know, this is really high level CPD and you've got the collaborative nature and people need to know how to engage with one another. Then this, this concept, this seems particularly important. I think this is an Andy Hargreaves term actually, but the concept of professional push and pull. So, so within these communities, there needs to be, um, it's not just about, um, well, stroking people and saying how great their practice is. There needs to be that professional discourse of, of people challenging one another. Yeah. And, and of course, you've almost got push and pull and then brackets trust, because of course yeah. you've got to have trust uh, amongst colleagues to do that. And then the whole, the whole concept around collective and collaborative leadership. Um, and again, Hargreaves talks about um, the leadership moving from a hierarchical model to actually almost the leadership model being that exchange of practice. So it's very much not, not hierarchical. It's, it's, it's teachers talking and developing practice that, that becomes the leadership tool. So, and, and, and again, we've, we've found, I think quite a lot of success with making hubs um, and schools plan explicitly for that. If they, if they want to go down the line of a, a professional learning community, which again, can be, a, as you say, it can be a model for sustained CPD. Yeah. Um, but it also can be a model where, you know, it becomes a bit of a talking shop and it doesn't really go anywhere. And I think using those principles are really, is really, really, really important. So brilliant. So you often mention in the Pathway course and whenever we've chatted, you've mentioned the importance of disciplined inquiry when you're setting up any sort of professional learning initiative. Why, what do you mean by that? And why is that so important that we should be considering that? So I think... Um, you know, I've done quite a lot of work in this area. And I think, you know, what, what ultimately, what is this about? This is about a structure that allows teachers to ask better, and hopefully answer, but ask better questions um, about their practice. So, so um, and it, it kind of involves taking, you know, what I call a, a sort of background question or a background focus which which could be oh I don't know you know trying to improve homework or something like that and then taking that area um, and really and really sharpening that up um, and and the, the process of discipline inquiry is absolutely key you've got to get this inquiry question right so a structure that I've used for that, and again, I mentioned in the pathway and put far more meat on the bones is this PCOT structure yeah. where you're outlining P is the, 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 the pupil or the problem. Um, I is the intervention. In other words, what are you going to do differently? C is the comparison. So how do you know, how are you going to, what are you going to compare it against? How do you get a sense of whether it works? O is the, is the outcomes. Um, what, are, what, are hope, what are the hopeful effects of this intervention? And then T is the time scale um, that, that you might be working to. So let me give you a done lots of work um, with um, representations in mathematics um, school because we know there's a there's a body of evidence behind that. So so it might and, and certainly worked with schools that want to look at number lines. Yeah, let, I'll use that example. So it's taking that kind of general question and being re really specific. So let, let me think. I'll 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 use one similar to the, the one I've got in the in the pathway course. So for, let's say for year four disadvantaged pupils, that's the P, that's the group you're gonna be focused on in 2022-23, um, that's the T, the time scale. Does the structured use of a number line for the addition and subtraction of fractions, that's the I, that's the intervention, improve the progress in this curriculum area, that's the outcome you're looking for compared to previous cohorts, that's the comparison. 
So that, that's quite a yeah. mouthful. But you get yeah, you get the point mm. I'm trying to make. Do, because yeah. you, then if teachers are asking those types of questions of themselves, but also working collaboratively, that allows them then to really sharpen their practice. And often some of these questions are quite difficult. Um, but it avoids this kind of genericism and the, and the sort of vagueness that they're really, really focused and tight questions. And then obviously there's there's the sort of architecture around how do you how do you create collaborative groups for staff to work within that? You know, what's what advice would they have? Um, what are you know, how are they going to use those comparison group? What data? There's all kinds of stuff underneath that. But the key bit to this is getting is getting that question absolutely nailed down and absolutely correct brilliant brilliant i mean there's a lot of planning involved in that isn't it it's not to be taken lightly i'm sure it isn't it's it, there's a lot of planning rigorous planning that goes into it if you want it to actually stick <laughs> um but that, that's it, right and and again there's focused. there's yeah there's something there again about um we found when we've rolled it out across schools where we're actually, I'll come back to it, being quite slow in the first instance and getting teachers to really think about the type of area and focus that they want to have is far more important than wading in and getting going with the process. Um, because it goes back to what I said before, you know, is it, is the area of focus really answering real questions for teachers and that, so actually that question is very very important of actually getting that that inquiry question correct and then everything else follows in a, in a fairly structured way it's funny I, I smiled a little bit when you said you know better to be sort of strategic and calculating and think about it rather than just sort of rushing in <laughs> and i perhaps like other head teachers on the call i don't know i suspect maybe um you know we've got lots and lots and lots of things in our in trade lots and lots of things that keep us busy all of which are important all of which are urgent all of which everybody wants to be done now and um <laughs> I, I i cpd is one of those and you want to sort of get it done get some impact in show why you did it justify to the governors why you've just spent that money do you know what i mean but it's longer than that isn't it we've had um we've had a question in from paul thank you paul what's the biggest challenge you've faced and trying to get teachers on board with training and how did you get them to engage great question paul Good question. better than mine <laughs> um the biggest challenge so um yeah i suppose there is a challenge i mean again we talked about this before andrew didn't we but there's a there's a challenge around um whenever you talk about engaging all staff in a process um, yeah. because there are levels of cynicism let's be honest there are levels of, of, of cynicism mm -hmm. of sort of saying well why you know why should I do this well this has come around again yes indeed <laughs> so so in in terms of how we overcame that I think again there is something around leadership walking the walk talking about a long term commitment to um, in, in this case discipline inquiry let's say so there's something around that there's also something around leaders getting involved in that process and actually maybe not leading that process but getting involved and reflecting that and then i think there's always um a case around creating a critical positive mass so you yeah. get staff involved that want to get in, involved and then they will start to um to, to generate enthusiasm and, and hopefully make it irresistible for other staff because they can see the level of, you know, I think there is cynicism in teachers, but I do fundamentally believe all teachers want to get better. Um, I think we have to believe that. So I think there's something around creating that excitement in your, in your institution from staff that are engaged in this and then looking at how you hook in um, some of the, the, the less keen people. And there's also then things around, if you're talking, if we talk about how important collaboration is, how do you group people? You know, who are you putting them with um, to make those groups work? Um, so I, but I do think, yeah, so, so leadership, creating that critical body of, of positivity and then looking at how you widen it out from there, I think. But I'm not, I'm not pretending it, it's, it, this is an easy challenge and it, particularly if you're talking about institute, institutional wide change. So in a sense of, you know, mandating one approach to CPD for everybody in a year, that may not be the right approach. It might be a case of being a little more softly, softly and looking at where the opportunities lie, because we know, you know culture doesn't change overnight, right? It, it, it needs to be, it takes a long time. So I think a sort of graduated, reasonable approach. 
And how will we know when it's working? How will you talked at the top of this about kind of assessing the efficacy of the, of the professional learning culture that, that we're establishing? How, how will we know that, you know, some of the levers we're pushing, the cultural levers and assets that we have, how will we know when it's kind of just because I need that impact. I need to see impact. I need to see it's working. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, so so I would certainly would refer to those Gusky's levels of evaluation yeah, um, and, be, and be realistic about, I mean, it, it's, as I say, it's referenced in the pathway, but there's a realism mm -hmm. around the time scales at which you should be looking for certain things. You know, if you're looking for an impact on, on pupils' outcomes after people have you know, engaged in CPD for two weeks, then you're going to be looking for the wrong thing. Obviously, that needs to be the ultimate thing, but there, there's certainly a, a reality um, a, a around what you should be looking for. I mean, in terms of, in terms of we, we did talk about culture, that's what we're here to talk about. So I think there's something around um, some of the things you might want to see, you know, a sort of common learner focused vision for a school. Um, a structured, systematic approach to to improving learning through CPD, whatever that looks like. That that's very that then everyone can articulate that. I think there's something around thinking about how we group people to work collaboratively. So moving away from a hierarchical model, and that's that PLC bit. Um, something around established norms for professional dialogue. So how do we talk to one another about our improving our practice? Is there a common language? Is there a common approach for doing that? Because again, I think that's fostered in trust. Um, and then also there's something I think around how do we share? Is it is it best practice or is it real practice? You know, best practice could be seen again as hierarchical, but actually are we taking the reality of what staff are, are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and trying to improve that as opposed to imposing what we think is the very best practice. Yeah, you see, it's that sense of, um, you know, not ground up, but you know what I mean? Not, not a, a hierarchical imposed model. And then do we, do we have regular opportunities to share challenges and, and celebrate successes, which I think is really, really important. And I think, you know, you, you, you could, there's lots of work with, with teachers getting to articulate what they've learned from their learning community or what they've learned from going through that disciplined inquiry process. And it's incredibly powerful. Um, and that goes a little bit back to, sorry, I've forgotten that was it Paul who was talking about, you know, cool. if, if to get people on board, we've got to be realistic about the challenges we face, but then we've absolutely got to celebrate some of the successes that have come out of our professional learning culture. Absolutely. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And in a way, as well as articulating so eloquently, as you always do, what a model for CPD could should look like, I think in so doing, I think, at least what I've heard, you've also articulated very nicely how we should be planning our teaching and learning in school, actually. Many of the different principles you just shared, they sounded to me like really good principles of, of planning for our lessons, actually. <laughs> yep. So if you want to find out much more, because obviously we, we've just had half an hour chatting now, but Chris spent a whole day filming up in Manchester for Discovery uh, Education, uh, putting together a whole series of different short films, discussions, roundtable discussions that we had as well, didn't we, in interviews? And you've accompanied that by many, many thousands of words of uh, proper academic writing. Really, really interesting, actually. Um, and referencing all the different um, sources that you've mentioned today, they're all in, they're all in that course. So um, a joy, as always, to talk pedagogy with you, sir. Thank you. you. You really are. It's um, you, you're the genuine article. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> really lovely. Lovely. So, um, and, and yes, just to say, I, I hopefully I, I haven't belittled or, or underplayed the challenges that leaders have, particularly at the moment in this area. But but my pledge, yeah. you know, almost closing pledge really is is I think there's a real danger as we oh, do come out of COVID, even though I'm very reluctant to say that. That, that we almost, in terms of professional learning, we almost don't challenge what a potential status quo might look like, where a lot of stuff, you know, is done twilight, is done online, when we know a lot of times teachers aren't really entirely focused. And I, and I think we can't take our eye off the ball as we move mm. out into a new normal to actually put professional learning still right at the top of the list in terms of our profession. Yeah, absolutely right. So anybody wants to get hold of you, how can they do that? Are you, you able to, I mean, obviously I can, I can send, you can email me, but do you want to share any details, any contact details? Um, I can, 
well, mm -hmm. I can share. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't got a summary. I can share my my email address is is cjdale25 at gmail dot com. So I'm more okay. than happy for people to to contact me Thank like you. that. CJ, just give it once more time if you don't mind. Cjdale and then the numbers twenty five and then at gmail dot com. Brilliant. Have you recently celebrated your twenty fifth birthday or something? Uh, <laughs> a few years ago. Yes, a few years ago. <laughs> I wish. I wish. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. So there's a contact detail if anybody wants to. Obviously, you can also get in touch with me through Discover Education. Your emails will come through. Oh, brilliant. I knew my my brilliant colleague, Bobby. What would we do without you, Bobby? Um, she's already put it in the in the chat. CJDale25 at gmail.com. Fantastic. Uh, it'd be lovely if, if people want to get in touch. I'm sure they will. Because although you do obviously have a very, very busy job, I know you're always willing and able to help fellow educators where where they where they need where they need some advice so uh, do get in touch with chris if you can brilliant chris thanks ever so much mate really enjoyed talking to you as always and you would um by all means stick around if you wish um but uh, for now i'm going to say cheerio and i'm going to just share my screen again but thank you again really appreciate your time thank you so much chris thanks Andrew. Um, thanks ever so much we'll see you again soon if anybody would like to stay on this on the on the call please do i'm going to share my screen and i'm actually just going to um well, i'm actually going to walk you through the um the actual program uh rather than uh give you a whole series of different powerpoints uh which i know is what i often do i think this time i'm actually going to walk you through the actual pathway program itself what is pathway well i'll answer that question um now so i'm actually going to just share my screen again forgive me and i'm going to actually uh, go on to uh the actual the actual pathway program itself if you like and i hope you're able to to see this just waiting for it to load up um, there we are. So this is actually the pathway program itself. This is this is what you'll land on, if you like. A uh, little bit of a preamble about our very important relationship with our brilliant friends at the NHT, NHT <coughs> National Association of Head Teachers, who have um, been absolutely wonderful in the way that they've supported this program and really got got their shoulders behind this, um, because they, like us, believe in this holistic approach, seeing the whole teacher, seeing the importance of sharing knowledge best practice and pedagogy, but at the same time, supporting teachers' well-being, their motivation um, and their career aspirations. So we're divided into three sections. We have orientation. And if you scroll down orientation, you'll see there's three different areas here. There's a motivation guide where you will find a fantastic course built up of, uh, again, academic reading material, um, questions for reflection, where there's open, open boxes where you can write whatever you like for your reflections, and that's recorded. You can keep coming back to it. It's private and secure. And then lots of films to watch where I sit down with a, a fantastic expert in the business of motivation in education, a chap called uh, Mark Turner, who's a former very experienced teacher, now working with school leaders and teachers about what motivates them in school. And it's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant course. Then we have a skills audit where you can write up your areas for development, areas of strength, and how you can keep coming back to those, perhaps matched against teachers' uh, standards, perhaps leadership standards, and also career maps as well, where you can write down in three different avenues, actually, the professional roles you'd like to secure, you'd like to have, and you'd like to in the years ahead. Also, the different extracurricular activities and interests that keep you motivated in school. How can you grow those in the years ahead? And then thirdly, your well-being, your health and well-being goals. How are you going to stay healthy? How are you going to stay a whole person? Because self-care, as we always say in Pathway, is not a self-indulgence. It's an absolute duty. You're surrounded, if you're like me, in this job by so many things that you need to do. I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to do this. I need to do that. But yeah, you need to breathe and you need to laugh and you need to love. And I think in Pathway, we try and, we try and see the whole person because uh, you're never going to clear your inbox. You're never going to achieve everything in, in one day. So I think orientation bit is time that you spend on yourself to orientate your career, to go back to why you're doing this, why you went into this profession in the first place, and to keep keep track and keep keep sight of those uh, long-term career goals uh, and guarding against burnout, frankly. And then the navigation section is where we have all the different courses. And I said at the top of this, that Pathway is more than one course. Uh, some people perhaps haven't quite grasped that, that it's it sort of see it as one course. It's many, many, many different courses all of which housed on this pathway platform. So really pathway is a platform rather than one course. And this is where we have, and you'll see CPE, continuous professional empowerment. If it doesn't empower you, I don't see the point. It's not just what you know that counts, is it? It's what you can do with what you know. And I think that's inextricably linked to how you feel. 
So we try and make this sustainable. We try and make this as much about you as a person as it is about you as a knowledge delivery system. <laughs> so we have a whole series of different courses, uh, many, many different courses, alphabetized here, alphabetically presented to you. And if you click on any of these courses, let's click on this one, doesn't matter which one, they're all built in exactly the same way. You have uh, a filmed introduction. This was with the brilliant Pran Patel, very experienced senior leader in schools and a champion for diversity, equality and inclusion. Brilliant course. Uh, a whole series of different chapters within this course. This is only just one of about 25 different courses, each of which requires several hours to complete, where you have films, uh, you have uh, questions for reflection, as I mentioned, you have some academic pieces to follow each time, and you click on each particular unit, you then press continue, you'll go to a film to watch with uh, a roundtable discussion with Pran and some other educators. We talked, in this particular case, we talked long and hard about diversity, equality and inclusion. We talked about unconscious bias. We talked about perhaps the sort of bias um, perhaps even, dare I say, censorship that perhaps I and people my age might have been subjected to in the curriculum that we were taught. We had a fantastic discussion about Shakespeare, but we also discussed Rumi, the brilliant, brilliant Middle Eastern poet. No one told me about Rumi when I was at school. Why is that? So we had a really interesting discussion about the curriculum and about how we can make it rich and diverse more than it is, perhaps. Lots of lessons were learned there. Really, really interesting. Um, and then a very fascinating thought piece, as always, from Pran to really make us think. Um, and then you continue to questions for reflection. And every course has these questions for reflection where you can write anything. I've just put random text in here, but you can you can put anything you like in, like in here. And that is always saved. And you could write a line, 10 lines, a 10,000 word thesis if you prefer. And you can store it and keep coming back to it. You can actually maybe even copy and paste that into some other studies that you might be doing, um, but it's up to you. But it's a, a very good, uh, professional learning journal, actually. And you can continue through to the next unit, to the next film. Fascinating discussion there on the purpose of education with Pran. Really thought provoking and fun, actually. Another thought piece and then some questions for reflection. Right. So and every course is built in the same way. So it becomes familiar. It becomes hopefully habitual. You always have introduction, film, and then you have a series of academic pieces and a series of questions for reflection. Uh, just come right out of the system again. I'm going to go back into pathway and then show you the third and final section, which is the reflection section. And here you'll find two brilliant, brilliant categories. Actually, one is the wellbeing program, which is another course. And it's a very big course with Professor Tim O'Brien and Dr. Dennis Guiney. And it's an absolutely terrific course on your wellbeing, on critical reflection, on running a small wellbeing project within your school, on managing both your wellbeing and the wellbeing of others and on navigating and traversing the emotional landscape. How wonderful that we're now talking about these things. We weren't when I started teaching 24 years ago. Now we are. We're recognizing the whole person behind, behind or at the front of the class, if you like, and how it's important to model these things to our students. And every course, again, is an introduction, a film, academic writing, and questions for reflection. Brilliant, brilliant course. And then finally, in the reflection section is, of course, that wonderful resource bank, the Advice Hub, which is populated and lead authored by Guy Dudley, senior editor of the Pathway Advice Hub, and of course, a very senior member of uh, NEHT, uh, heading up their advice department and on the phone to head teachers, to school leaders uh, and senior leaders and so forth and governors every day on the, the things that matter in their jobs. So any of these tiles is filled with the very latest uh, PDFs, really, newsletters, advice pieces. This is just one of 12 tiles. This is human resources. Typically, as we know, from anybody who does this job, HR is going to be a big, big, big section. <laughs> There's a lot of HR stuff sometimes. We understand that. And these are all individual pieces of design, uh, designed to uh, enable you to get to the very latest information you need very quickly. Often it's populated by links that will send you off to different uh, websites to save you time. Uh, the very latest advice from really from the people who really know from the NEHT, from Guy Dudley, uh, who's always got his finger on the pulse of, of what's needed and when. So a brilliant, brilliant resource bank, I have to say, it really is. This is just one of 12 tiles uh, of resources, and I'm constantly uploading every week. I'm uploading these resources that come in from Guy and his team at the NEHT uh, for you. Um, 
any different i mean there's so many there's so many different things you know in safeguarding as you can expect there's some very important pieces there uh 10 top 10 survival tips for senkos keeping children safe obviously the changes in kixi as we know about uh, preventing responding to harassment and violence social networking online safety in schools any of these pdfs we're con constantly updating them constantly uploading new ones little link there to a website uh, that we feel would be useful for you to for you to read and see another one there uh, really useful news newsletters and updated advice pieces and then finally there is actually a newsletter that we produce uh, twice a term here which guy has written many pages long we've got a lot now because we've been around a little while now so if we look at I know the latest one here that's just dropped actually just landed this is built up made up of all the very latest um, advice that we think you might need focusing on various different things over every every newsletter so over the course of a year you you've covered just about everything um, but any urgent things that we feel you need to know covid updates for example we'll put into our uh, twice termly newsletter and of course as always some links to some things we're focusing on a send review there this time uh, for you to save time to go straight to the information where you need it right i think i've outstayed my welcome there it's quarter two thank you so much for staying staying on the call this long uh, we're busy people i hope gosh i hope you're able to get home at some stage this evening it's middle of the week so i also hope that you're able to switch your laptop off at a reasonable hour and switch off in the middle of the week. I always try and I, I'm trying to avoid the phrase wine Wednesdays, but you know, you know, that's what I was going to say. So let's see if you get some time to yourself. Thank you again for uh, for joining us. Uh, my colleague has just put on the chat stream. Thank you. Uh, join our next advice hub. So we actually have another webinar actually coming up very soon, actually very shortly, which uh, I do hope you'll be able to join us for. I'm just going to share it now. So it's called Advice for the Current Times, and it's always with um, the brilliant Guy Dudley. And it's Tuesday, the 29th of March at 4 p.m. So Guy and I will sit down, as we do every month or so, to go through the latest issues that will be on, we think, will be on school leaders' minds. Advice for the Current Times with Guy, four o'clock, same place, as it were. If you'd like to find out more about the Discovery Program, Discovery Education Program from uh, Discovery Education and the NHT, then go onto this URL here. Uh, I'm sure that'll be in the chat stream as well from Bobby. Thanks, Bobby. Um, so click on that forward slash pathway and you will be taken to lots of information pages. And there's a place there where you can get in touch with us and see if uh, Pathway is an online platform for you. We'd love to hear from you. Great. Thank you. Just remains for me to say thank you and, uh, and goodbye. And we'll see you at the next webinar. Many thanks for joining. Bye bye.